Get our legends. I hope that you're doing really well. Now, today we do have a lot to talk about and some footage to look at inside some of these areas and some more footage from the naval drones too. So today we're going to talk about the battle in the sea, some false flag operations, both that have seemed not to happen, uh, that were warned about, but also that could be upcoming, as well as some movements on the map. I think there are some very interesting movements, although some are reporting that there isn't much but we'll look over it and you can tell me what you think so yesterday we saw that two russian ships got hit a landing craft like warship and a tanker so we have footage and this was released last night only an hour or so after uh then i released my video on this so that was bloody annoying but some footage from the ukrainian drone coming in and hitting the sig tanker so let's watch this through and then we'll sort of break it down a little bit now as we can see from the front of this drone boat this seems to be the same type uh, that then hit uh, the landing craft warship as well i know that's no surprise to people but we do know there are different uh, variants of this we have been seen and this is as many are saying a newer one so here we see the sig you can see that it is a tanker by then the bridge coming in on a 45 degree angle and then we'll see it then cut out as it was there. Now, we don't have any real updates on what the damage was to that ship, but I think there's some interesting bits in here. So this is the SIG here. I watched this a few times. So this seems to be the SIG. Now, I don't know. We're just going to skip through. So they come from the SIG and the boat does like a big 360 from here, turning then back onto the SIG and then, of course, the strike. Now, I don't really know why it is so close here. Now, one, you, the, the, the drone boat has no real uh, threat being this close. You know, this isn't an armed ship. It's not like a warship where if it comes up like this, it could be, you know, taken out. So I guess that. But I'm thinking, why would it be doing this? You can see that there's lights here that tend to indicate other ships or the shoreline here. So I'm not really sure, but some of these look like they could be closer ships maybe it was coming in because it is dark to actually and the camera footage isn't great and the live footage back to whoever's steering this is probably worse again if you've ever seen like the analog drone stuff that they may just actually be confirming that it's the sig they've confirmed it blah 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 and then come in permission on strike from there so i'm not really sure that's just my speculation but the, i was thinking about why would that you know well, the sig here and they've done the, this into it i don't know i think it might just be confirming what it actually was so let's talk about the SIG. In 2019, the US Department of the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, governments love bloody acronyms. <laughs> anyway, they sanctioned the SIG along with several other vessels and individuals. So what they say, participating in a sanctions evasion scheme to facilitate the delivery of jet fuel to Russian forces operating in Syria. Now, as we know, the Russians are in Syria, so are the Americans, but on different sides. We're behind the rebels, they're behind the Assad. So that's a story for another bloody time. But if you're interested in Syria, I was actually in Syria in the rebel-held area this year. It's one of my favourite videos I've ever done, and it got zero traction anywhere. I don't know why, but I really enjoyed it. It's more sweet than reporting, I believe. Anyway, but this has caused quite a stir online, with a lot saying it's a bunch of excuses to whitewash a deliberate attack on a civilian ship, with others saying a civilian ship with nothing to hide turns off the AIS for a week. Now, the AIS is the Automatic Identification System, and we actually have here, um, and Aussie Technical is the one that broke some of this down to give them uh, credit here then had the AIS records here. And as we can see, many trips and the AIS is turned off for about a week as they're outbound and then inbound from here. So it's off and on. And that's where it comes from of, you know, why would that then be off? Now, I'm no bloody captain, but I'm somewhere in the middle of this. And I won't say that it wasn't a military target, but is it as much as like the warship? Not really. If it's empty coming back on a trip, how does that come into it? I don't really know. This this goes back to a lot of the problems even on a more, or maybe more complex, again, or more simple. Like in Afghan, you'd have, you know, a Taliban guy shooting at you, say, and then throw down the weapon, pick up a rake, and oh, I'm just a farmer now. How does that actually work in this? And that's where so much of these wars against two belligerents and when you're including other organisations, gets absolutely 
shady and I don't want to step on the foot of any lawmakers here or there. But again, I'm somewhere in the middle. But I do think that Ukraine may have somehow somewhat shot themselves in the foot with this. You know, we spoke about how the EU, especially Joseph Borrell, has been urging the EU to persuade Putin to renegotiate the grain deal in the Black Sea. And I don't have that in front of me, but it's on my computer here. If you're ever wondering, I've got a few different bloody computers open in front of me. So this was released by The Guardian, quoting Joseph Brother. The EU urges the G20 to help persuade Putin to reopen Ukraine grain export, saying we need international opinion to speak on the issue with the clear and unified voice. We owe it to those in need, talking about the amount of food that goes then into food programs in developing countries. So of course, talking about the termination of the Black Sea Grain Initiative there. But I think that this uh, might turn that back. I think that this is not now going to you know come to the table about this. And I think it sets a danger, dangerous precedent. Firstly, I don't see Russia re-entering the conversation about the grain deal. And second, potentially targeting Russia targeting civilian ships bound for Ukraine. As we know, the shipments of grain for Ukraine is absolutely vital for their economy, with the UN accusing Putin of weaponizing hunger, as Putin accuses the UN of weaponization of sanctions. And China has also said the same about the UN towards Russia. So I'd like to know what you actually think of this situation. But yes, as we've seen some successful attacks in the Black Sea, which have absolutely been embarrassing for Russia's navy, but Russia still does have the overwhelming majority of naval power in this region. And although the scale does tip slightly with these drones, it does this, it's not 50-50. As offensive capability of weapons always comes before the defensive. We develop the weapon to do it before someone develops the counter to it. And with uh, airborne cheap drones, seaborne drones, and um, submersible drones as well. This is all still fairly new tech, and the counters for this it eventually will come. Uh, they probably exist, but it's probably very expensive or you know not that efficient at the moment. But offensive capability comes first, and then the defence for that. So that will be where so many people are working. So if we enter a war, we don't want these small FPV drones wreaking absolute havoc, which they have, but the naval power hasn't, it hasn't done this, as some are definitely saying. So overnight, there has been significant barrages, again, of Russian ballistic missiles through many regions of Ukraine, with reports of up to 15 Tu-95, which are a bare aircraft, being airborne at once, as well as caliber cruise missiles coming from the Black See. Unconfirmed reports have also flowed in from Ukrainian sources claiming that at least one missile was launched from inside Belarus, but stating by Russian forces, not by Belarusian forces, but within Belarus's uh, border. But there's also been a wave of strikes from Ukraine into occupied territory as well, being reported as non-stop explosions in Donetsk. And here we have uh, the Donetsk University of Economics and Trade. And this video has been going viral as many will claim that it was Russia that striked this or it was Ukraine that struck that. Now, one thing I will say here is both complete sort of um, alts of the side are wrong. Has Donetsk been under just barrage f f since 2014? Not non-stop barrage. Has there been strikes go into Donetsk and um, tragically kill civilians and children? Well, absolutely as well. So both sides are correct in slim bits of their argument, but not then all of it. And that's what I'm trying to do is get somewhere down the middle and try and cut out those biases. But we do see this building here, of course, being the University of Economics, uh, then on fire from a strike here. And we see... Um, I don't know why I'm pointing at my screen. We see firefighters moving in from there. So, But we've also seen so many strikes as well uh, across Ukraine and one uh, particularly on somewhere where uh, they stored blood too, which as we know in offensive uh, operations is incredibly important. This was one of the big giveaways early uh well, actually before the 24th of February of the war when the Russia was claiming they were just exercises on the border. A sort of lights went off in my head when it was saying, oh, Russia's bringing a lot of blood to the front line. You're like, well... Not that many people get hurt or killed in exercises in the military. It, of course, it does happen. Military shit training is dangerous, but not not a bloody trucks full of blood. Um, so that was one of those sort of ding, 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 what is going on from here. But of speaking about Belarus, I've seen a lot of support for Ukraine potentially targeting and 
you know, staging further military involvement into Belarus, which personally I think for both sides who are struggling to have a fully manned front line with the ability to then actually rotate in and out fresh troops without losing ground. And we've seen that, that as one side will try and rotate their fresh troops, that amount of ground gets taken within that um, Hoto handover takeover period. And that the last thing they need is another front line opening and then further stretching out both Russian and Ukrainian resources further, although I think that would be slightly maybe in Belarus Russia's advantage to open a front line there. And I've spoken about how that, you know, then could happen. I've long wondered too, though, about what would actually happen if NATO shot down missiles from Belarus. Would Russia actually do anything or they sort of leave Lukashenko then out to dry? I'm not particularly sure in that, but we're going to talk a bit more about Belarus in a second. So, for these strikes, these naval stuff, whatever, the Ukrainian uh, official defence page has had this then to say on Twitter. So it's number one and number two here. So since 1991, Russia has systematically used the territorial waters of Ukraine to organise armed aggressions against the Georgian people and against the people of Syria. Today, they terrorise peaceful Ukrainian cities and destroy grain, condemning hundreds of millions to starvation. It's time to say to the Russian killers, it's enough. There are no more safe waters or peaceful harbours for you in the Black Sea and as of seas. Next, stating this, two can play at that game. Indicating more uh, strikes from these drones or other drones, both um, airborne, seaborne drones into the Black Sea and these waters that could be then connecting through to Syria as well. So I think this is a few things. With bogged down defensives on the front line, it does seem that the attention has turned to striking further into the Russian military. Either these drones going into Moscow or they see drones going further uh, down into other areas too. Now, is this a sign of things to come or part of a plan that will come together to weaken then the front line defensives through uh, logistical problems? I don't know. Or is it a sign, as some are saying, of desperation where there needs to be some positive PR out there. So I think it probably sits 50-50 somewhere in that, that it's a bit of both. And positive PR is very important for a war like this, where democratic countries are you know, supporting the government's uh, through votes to get into power to actually do this. There's a lot in play. And PR, propaganda, that plays a huge, huge factor in wars and I guess the popularity or... Um, how people feel about the ongoing conflict. So, but I do feel that a lot of people are waiting on some like decisive moment then triggers more, like dominoes then collapsing. And we could see that. And I think we've seen many moments that I thought were it or could have been it. Uh, the first being the appearance of the Leopards and the Bradleys on the front line. And then I guess the early success on the flanks of Bakhmut. Uh, the attacks then on Moscow and now the attacks on the Kerch a couple of weeks ago, but it seems to not be followed up by any decisive action. Maybe there's a bigger picture that I'm not seeing, but it just doesn't seem like it's like one leads into then the next. So one thing I did want to look at too, this is off that topic to bridge between these, is the old cope cage. So we see a very old Russian, uh, I believe, T-55 tank here with, as people will say, the cope cage. Now, these cages, these aren't... The cope cage thing, I think, is just fucking stupid. Is this going to stop a javelin? No. Javelin has two warheads specifically to get through things like this uh, or uh, ERA, explosive reactive armour. Cope cage is a thing. Absolutely. We use them everywhere uh, through Iraq, Afghan, for specifically RPGs. RPGs are being used heavily here. Now, the main thing of it is to set it off before it then hits the armour, so uh, to sort of uh, re uh, blow it up first so that um, shape charge doesn't have the effect on the armour that it would have, prematurely setting it off, which I'm sure every bloke out there has had a premature set off before in their life. But here we see literally this RPG warhead stuck in the cage here. And this isn't, it's rare, but it's not a, it's not a once in a bloody lifetime. Uh, personally, I've never seen this, thank God, but I've had many guys be like, yeah, we're on our bar armour, uh, so at least we call it in Australia, like the armour um, cage that sits, sat off the vehicles, it wouldn't be that uncommon to see an RPG stuck in the side of an American Australian vehicle that was operating that hit from uh, an RPG. So that has worked there. And I think that is an example of how it works. Is it perfect? No. Is it going to stop NLAW JAV? No. 
Will it stop some things? Yeah, it's probably bloody, well, I'd be bloody putting it on if I was driving around out there. So the SBU, Ukraine's uh, security service, have claimed that they've uncovered plans for a false flag operation that will then drag Belarus into the conflict. And they've released this then on their website, talking about Wagner PMC. But I don't know how involved Wagner would want to be really currently as we've seen them definitely training in Belarus, but they have a lot on their hands in Africa. And if you have a look at, say, like History Legends talking about uh, Wagner in uh, Belarus over the past years and particularly now, I think that is very interesting. It's something I'm not really over, but I really should be. So they released this then on their website, uh, August the 4th at 1300. The SBU established that Russia wants to use Wagnerians to involve Belarus in a full-scale war against Ukraine. Now, there is a video, but it is uh, basically just reading this out off a teleprompter. So, the Security Service of Ukraine obtained intelligence that testifies to the preparation of a large-scale provocation by the Russians under a foreign flag false flag. Uh, at the strategic object of Belarus, the Mosia Oil Refinery. According to the available data, the preparation of the terrorist attack is being carried out by a sabotage and intelligence group made up of personnel of the armed, the Russian armed forces and employees of the Russian special services who were sent to the territory of Belarus under the guise of Wagnerians. This Russian DRG should commit a provocation at the refinery pretending to be Ukrainian saboteurs. The Russian Federation plans to blame Ukraine for what has been done in order to once again try and draw it draw Minsk into a full-scale war against our state. The security service employees received information about a planned terrorist attack in Belarus from several sources, in particular from the testimony of a serviceman of the Soviet Union who was taken prisoner by Ukrainian defenders in the Zaporizhia redirection. Cyber specialists of the SBU also recovered and analysed the information on the mobile phone of a captured Russist. Uh, amongst other things, it was established that he had previously participated in hostilities against the Defence Force in the south of Ukraine and recently he was instructed to relocate to Belarus as a member of the private uh, military company Wagner. Now, this is sounding a lot like Wagner's mutiny to get Wagner guys then out into Belarus where they got basically immunity from everything. I continue... Already at the stage of changing the place of service, the Russian military received information about a special mission at the Mosier oil refinery. In his phone, SBU cyber specialists found deleted correspondence with other performers, pictures of the object and separate information about the operation. The security service warns the Belarusian army against participating in a full-scale war against Ukraine. Every invader who crosses the border of our state will be destroyed by our security and defense forces we know there has been uh, more people on that border and like a physical border wall uh, made a lot more in that region too and built up now speaking on false flags earlier this month president Zelensky and has cited his intelligence services warning that russia was planning a false flag operation on the znpp the zaporangia nuclear power plant giving serious warning and even releasing safety videos of what to do in the situation of uh, the radiation that could happen from there. So the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, had insisted at the time that they had not seen any explosive devices that could undermine the safety of the plant, but mines were placed outside, but they wouldn't do anything to like the actual reactors. Although saying that they were seeking more access, uh, that the IAEA has now released another statement after being granted access then on a further rotation. So we have that here. So, uh, update 177 on the 4th of August, International Atomic Energy Agency experts have observed no mines or explosives on the rooftops of Unit 3 and 4 reactor buildings and the turbine holes of the ZNPP uh, after having been given access yesterday afternoon. Following repeated requests, the, requests, the team had unimpeded access to the rooftops of the two reactor units and could also clearly view the rooftops of the turbine halls. The team will continue its request to visit the roofs of the other four units of the ZNPP. Uh, the director has stressed the importance of the IEA experts being granted timely access to all areas of ZNPP to monitor full compliance with the five nuclear basic principles here. And that is basically the safety uh, net put in for uh, nuclear power plants around the world. Uh, 
Director General Rafael Moreno Grossi has said, I welcome the news the IEA experts have finally been granted this additional access at the site. Timely, independent and objective reporting of facts on the ground is crucial to continue the IAEA's efforts to support nuclear safety and security during the military conflict in the country. Access to the result on Thursday came after a successful ninth rotation of the teams at the plant. Experts once again crossing the front line as the teams departed and arrived at the plant. Now, interestingly, on the night before the rotation, the team reported hearing a series of detonations in the vicinity of the plant. The team was informed by the ZMPP that there was no impact on the site, the neighbouring industrial area or the city of Erna Hadar, as a result of then these detonations. So... It's a very interesting situation here. Was it a um, an attack that was going to, as a false flag that was going to take place? Because what Ukraine is basically saying is Russia is going to detonate something and then blame us then for hitting it and creating this disaster here. Was it actually happening and then Ukraine spoiled it, made it public, and then Russia has pulled it down? Was it uh, a threat of you know, more provocation and around here PR? We don't really know. You never really know with this stuff exactly what is going on. So, I digress. Let's have a look at the maps over some stuff and we'll finish it off there. So, of course, we have Ukraine in the centre, the capital of Kiev. The red areas, areas occupied uh, since 22, the purple since 14. Now, that is going to come um, more into play as we go on. This is the Sea of Azov, and this is the Black Sea, where Ukraine has said that they will strike in anywhere in the Black Sea, and of course, the Sea of Azov. Here we have Romania, Poland, Belarus, and Russia around here. So, where we are going to come down into, and we haven't seen too much movement, but I think we have seen some level of critical movement. So, down then to the south of Orkiv, we have seen that Russia has made some ground. So, Ukraine did make a lot of ground in here over you know, the past week or so. So, we did see this push out so let's go 10 days we did see this push but from the fifth to then the sixth being today so this map's about four and a half hours old we did see russia take back a fair bit of ground in here although uh, ukraine still does hold this southern region to robotini which could then um, launch a further assault then down so let's have a look and see on this so ukraine has got some of these um, positions here as well but Russia has taken some of these defensive works down. But as we've talked about, this is one of the heaviest defended areas down, especially down into Melitopol. And I'd like for you guys to think where, how far do you think this will get um, before the end of the years? We're seeing a lot of maps saying, yeah, but the offensive is this blue and this blue area. But like I keep saying, that offensive operations are a lot uh, then like bankruptcy. It happened a little bit, a little bit, and then can go all at once. But you'll see some defi uh, decisive actions come into play. Now, I don't have another map showing that. We're just relying on the deep state because the ISW doesn't then show that. So where we're going to pull is up into here. Now, this is just to the west of Donetsk City and to the north of Mariinka. We've spoken about a lot. Now, you will see that I have got it on uh, the satellite image just because it'll be easier to line up. Now, of course, this is the purple region here, occupied since 14. So we did see maybe a month ago, and I think this was actually underreported because it's the first time it's happened, Ukraine did actually take positions here that were held since 14 off the Russians uh, a while back. Now, what we do have is uh, today we have had from Zurich maps, they have said that Russia has taken back some ground up here, has taken back the positions that were previously then occupied and more uh, on the way up into Krasnodarivka. Now, this is not being actually shown uh, across the deep state or the ISW as well. And like I always say, I like you know to be verified across at least a couple of things. But just to line this up, where we need to look at is uh, where some of these uh, fence lines are as the roads in the paddocks too. So we will just come in here. So we see whatever these lines are through here, which is either the edge of the city or uh, agricultural work here, and as well as this road that bends slightly to uh, the southeast and then uh, to the east. So we're looking in this vicinity here. So Zurich Maps does show that this dotted line is where more ground was then made. And that is then the zoom out of then where we are speaking about. So then where we're going to come is deep state again near uh, Novoselivsky here. And we've spoken about this region a lot to the west of Svatov. So it's in the north of the country here is Svatov. And this is where we're speaking about. Now, on the deep state, 
this is, I believe, the only place we actually saw movement today. So we do see, and let's just get the satellite so you might get a better idea of exactly what we're looking at here. We do see this push, sorry, it went the wrong way, into Novoselivsky. Now, the Russian sources are saying that this was then taken. We do know, you'll see these white lines at the defended areas, that this is an area of a lot of fighting where Russia has pulled a lot of troops into this northern region, as many will say, to pull Ukrainian troops off where they're having more success in the south and the east to pull them up here. And although they're not launching full-scale offensives, they are having some success here. But as Zurich Maps will say, they don't have the resource to actually launch full-level offensives here. So this is what the map from Zurich Maps is then saying. So Let's have a look. So here is Novoselivsky. So they're saying that they are well past where this area is. So what we will line up is, say, this square paddock here with these two um, thinner ones going west to east. So have a look here that it's saying the borderline is more down through here and is across here. So a lot more ground has been taken there. Um, referring to the Shurek maps, who does show... Um, some geolocated footage as well, and I can't show that, as well as saying that Ukraine had many attempts as assaults in here uh, that didn't really pan out super well. So as well, the battle for Novoselivsky has come from Ryba Russian sources and is showing that they have pushed well out through here. Now, let's actually just line these two up not showing similar, but I believe this is showing more similar than to then the Suryak maps here, that Russia has taken a lot more ground down here than uh, Rybo is showing, so that's saying more down straight across here, but showing sort of the same on this um, western flank, although this is more grey zone here, but the town itself of uh, Novoselivsky has showing a about the same here, but I think Surak map is showing more than the Rybar Russian sources, so I think that is very interesting. So, then we're going to go on to then the ISW map because I want to show you another change which isn't being shown across really any of the maps except for this a few days apart. So where we were just talking is then in Zvatov. So we're talking Novoselsky, which I believe here probably shows closer to what Surek maps is showing. But just to the due east of Zvatov as well in here, in this Kamazienkivka, uh, just go with that. We see that a large amount of ground then was taken. So the claimed area has absolutely uh, pushed out from here. So we see this is where this waterway runs up through here. So we can see it's split into two, that this split is basically saying that it's off here of where Russia is claiming their control, but the assessed control, and the red on this is really what we're looking at, is where it's assessed by geolocated and whatever, has pushed a long way. So we have um, Novodarani down here. This is looking fairly similar, and then it absolutely shows that through here has been taken by the Russian forces crossing across here and taking more in there. So that is showing that Russia is having more success in the north. So there was an update that shows Ukraine did make back some territory. We did see Russia take some in Avdivka maybe a week ago, and then Ukraine today has taken some back in Avdivka. But the rest of the front line is looking fairly stable. You know, things in Bakhmut haven't really changed for a couple of days. Maybe the green moves a bit, but that isn't... Um, too much movement there. There's a bit around Kromove, but not on assessed on the front line. So that's really what we're looking at. Now, Belarivka, have we seen any movement there? Not really. We did see Russia make some territory there. So the front line, although somewhat stagnant, there is definitely a bloody lot happening. So we speak a lot about Svatov up here in uh, the northeast. And Kremenar here, we've seen a lot of fighting in and around this forest. Not that much movement. There's sometimes a lot, sometimes not much in and around Kremenar, Dobrova here. But there has been footage released um, from a Russian here. You can, I'm bloody guessing a Russian by the patch of the Kremenar forest saying that there's not a single twig left on any of the trees. You can just see how much fighting must have taken place in here. And you still see just the regrowth here. So when you see like, a lot of the forest videos, this is most likely where it is then happening. And of course, built up areas like this, Tanks and armoured vehicles can't move through this other than on the roads. So, of course, this is some of the heaviest fighting we'll see where guys are jumping in trenches, moving through on foot. So this is an incredibly hard case where a lot of artillery will be um, used, soldiers on foot. It's a really hectic place. And this looks like images you'll see out of the world wars. And, of course, there's been more footage released uh, inside Bakhmut as well. So we see... A Russian soldier, I'm guessing here, walking around, looking at the absolute sheer destruction 
of Buckmoot. Now, this isn't the only video here, but there are many videos released in Buckmoot and some drones too, showing the uh, severe breakdown of the city. Anyway, Legends, this one may have been a bit longer, but this was easier on me definitely than last than yesterday's was bloody hard to make than it perform shits so i was like no my voice is slightly cracking though so that'll end it for me legends look after yourselves if you'd like to support me there's links down below but never feel obliged i just appreciate you guys being here if you got to this point you're a bloody legend certified by willie fucking stamp thank you have a great start to your week don't get the sunday blues speak to you soon Bye bye